the, the, the legal mandate is 0%. If you look at in the seven, when the Fed was given the dual mandate by Congress, it's it's zero percent is the mandate in writing. The reason, but the two and even Ben Bernanke has said recently, the two percent target was created by the Fed without the approval of Congress, and so Congress has because Congress has not challenged the Fed on this issue. The Fed has taken it as that's an implicit. Uh, you know, green light that the Fed can pursue a 2%. But the, the Congress has the right to say, no, no, your mandate is zero. Jesse Felder joins us today. He is the founder of Felder Investment Research, and we'll be talking about the major macro themes every investor needs to follow for this year and beyond. Jesse, big fan of your work. Uh, thank you for being here on my show, The David Lynn Report. You've got your own podcast. You've got your own report. And you've got uh, a lot of other media appearances online, so people can find out more about your work there. But happy to host you today. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, David. I'm excited to uh, chat about markets and whatnot. Markets are volatile today, uh, as they've been in the last couple of days. And w- I want to talk about recent news first, because it seems like the investors, or short-term investors at least, are reacting to the debt ceiling back and forth that we're seeing just today, as we're speaking on Wednesday. Uh, House Speaker McCarthy says that the debt ceiling talks are so hung up on the spending. As you as you know, two days ago, uh, President Biden, or three days ago rather, President Biden rejected the latest debt ceiling proposal. And, um, you know, it doesn't seem to be like, uh, it doesn't seem to me at least, that they're reaching a resolution soon and their deadline is approaching. Markets are a little bit worried. Are you worried? Well, you know, I, I, I'm worried uh, less about the the possibility of them not reaching agreement, more about the, the effects on liquidity, uh, even if they do reach an agreement. When you look at, you know, something like the Treasury General account, just the, you know, the, the, the Treasury's kind of working account, there's a really close inverse correlation with the S&P 500. So when, you know, the treasury is, you know, draining that account, that's a net positive for liquidity when they're building up the treasury general account by issuing new treasuries, that's a drain on liquidity. And what we've seen is, you know, through this, you know, process of hitting the debt ceiling and seeing the treasury general account be essentially drained over the last few months, it's been net positive for liquidity, but you know, let's say they get a deal done and then the Treasury has to go issue. I mean, estimates are, you know, well over a trillion dollars of new Treasury bills just this summer. Uh, that could potentially be a significant drain on liquidity uh, with them building up that Treasury general account again. That's not bullish for uh, for risk assets, and competing assets generally. But you were talking to me offline, this speaks to a larger fiscal problem that the U.S. is facing. I mean, the U.S. probably faces several fiscal problems. Which one are you alluding to? Well, I, I'm just talking about the, the trajectory of the, the deficit, right? Um, you know, this is the, the during this economic recovery in the post kind of after the onset of COVID, um, it's been the worst fiscal recovery that we've ever seen um, in the country's history, right? We went from a massive deficit to... Uh, about 5% deficit of around 5% of GDP at its best. And it's now widening again towards 6 7%. We've never had an economic recovery that's seen the deficit, um, you know, have such a poor uh, recovery. And so we had an opportunity to, to you know, kind of get our fiscal house in order. Um, and we, we didn't really take that opportunity, uh, you know. And, and so I think, you know, Stan Druckenmiller gave the commencement address at, uh, you know, USC's business school you know, just about, a, I don't know, a few weeks ago. And he had a perfect metaphor. He said, everyone's staring at the debt ceilings, like standing on the Santa Monica Pier, looking out at a big wave that's rolling in, you know, 10, 20 foot wave. Meanwhile, behind that, behind the debt ceiling is a, a massive tidal wave that's that's on the horizon coming in, uh, you know, b- well behind it. And that represents the the, the widening um, deficit situation where we're we're at the point where uh, you know it, we shouldn't be seeing a widening deficit during an economic recovery. That's where we're at, and uh, it's going to take the fact that we can't even agree on minor changes to you know the fiscal structure without having a complete breakdown in the government is not a good sign for you know or, uh, the much bigger reforms that need to happen in order to to fix this bigger bigger fiscal uh, crisis that we're headed for uh, earlier in the year in March the uh, the White House did release a budget reduction a budget deficit reduction plan they plan to reduce the budget deficit by 
nearly three trillion dollars over ten years. This is a very extensive document, uh, but basically we can sum it up as increasing corporate taxes, increasing taxes on wealthy, and including billionaires. Uh, generally, uh, you know, it's a lot of tax raising and cost cutting on 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 several fronts. Do you think that the budgeting priorities for the government will shift dramatically over the next few years? There's no no chance of it, right? I mean, the fact that the, the negotiations we've been watching over the last week or so are, are, I think, an indicator that there's just no hope of a bipartisan agreement on 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 fixing the fiscal problems that we face. And and the reason is when you look at what is the real driving force behind the deteriorating fiscal trend, it's really uh, Social Security and Medicare and and these types of things, and neither party wants to touch those. And so, so long as that is the case, that neither party will touch uh, entitlements, the, the deficit's going to be on a widening trajectory for as far as the eye can see. Uh, it's just, that, that's just the fact of the matter. And so, you know, I mean, I've, I've seen studies that show you could literally tax the, the wealthiest 1% in the country. You could put, implement 100% income tax and you're not going to fix these problems. You could cut discretionary spending dramatically, create a significant recession, you're not going to fix these problems. It, you have to reform entitlements somehow. And because neither party is willing to do that at this point, we, you know, that's why there's this tidal wave on, on the horizon. I've heard, and please add or correct me if, um, if you like, I've heard that there are different ways that the government can raise money. Taxation is one. Uh, direct revenues from government-owned companies is one. Inflation is another. <laughs> Am I missing any, Jesse? You know, yeah, I mean, I, who knows, I, right? There's There could be a lot of creativity, you know, <laughs> and how to, how to raise revenue. But I just don't, I, you know, I, I think if you, what we did, what ended up happening during COVID was we implemented MMT, right? We, we went down the modern monetary theory path. Now, MMT tells you if you get inflation um, as a result of implementing MMT, there's a real easy fix, and you have to raise taxes to the point that brings inflation back down. That's MMT's remedy. Now, obviously, uh, you know, federal government's not willing to do that, and which is why MMT is so dangerous. Because it's very easy to say, okay, implement, you know, as much uh, as much deficit spending as you want until inflation rises, as long as you're willing to raise taxes enough to rein in that inflation. Because I don't think that the Fed can can do it on its own. You need some fiscal help in reining in this inflation problem. But if the fiscal authority is not willing to do that, then that means inflation is a bigger problem potentially than the central bank can can address alone. Is there a relationship between the widening deficit and inflation? Can we, which is to say that if inflation, sorry, if the deficit widens, like yeah. you're anticipating it to, yeah. uh, will we also see inflation rise as a result? Yeah, I mean, and it comes back into to the interaction between fiscal and monetary policy, I think. And it's if the deficit is on a widening, you know, tr tr in, in an exorable path wider, that means Treasury, you know, the, the you know, the path of federal debt is going to be uh, growing significantly. Right. In order to to make up the difference. Now, you get to a point where there's too much debt uh, and there's not enough buyers out there. And so I think the markets start anticipating that the Fed will be forced to monetize that debt. And so it comes really comes back to the Fed's balance sheet that Ben Bernanke was asked in 2010 or 11 um, by Con when he's testifying in front of Congress, uh, you know, why is Q quantitative easing? not money printing. And he said, well, it's not money printing. And I'll tell you why. So this is a, he said, this is a short term measure to support the economy. And when we normalize the balance sheet in relatively short order, that's how you'll know this wasn't money printing. Right. He said that over a decade ago and the balance sheet hasn't been normalized. So by Ben Bernanke's definition, what the Fed has done has been money printing, has been monetizing the debt. And so to the extent that the Fed is unable to normalize the balance sheet, I think is a clear signal to markets that the central bank is now being forced to monetize increasing amounts of debt at the federal level. So I think when you see those the deficit widening, that makes it clearer to, I think, markets, market participants, that the Fed is not going to be able to normalize the balance sheet. It's going to have to monetize the debt. 
that is a long-term inflationary dynamic. And it's especially damaging, I think, to inflation psychology. So monetizing the debt would mean they're expanding the Fed's balance sheet. Does that necessarily also imply that the money supply, let's say M2, would also increase? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, we've seen M2 decline, um, you know, as part of the Fed's versal for its hawkish monetary policy. Right. I think we're seeing actually the steepest decline in M2 in a, in a very long time. Um, and that's that's basically a reflection of the the reversal in monetary policy. But uh, you could argue that, uh, you know, back in March, when Silicon Valley Bank, we started having some some of these banking problems and the Fed extended its balance sheet to, you know, uh, try and calm uh, markets and and offer uh, emergency funding to a lot of these banks. That was potentially a reversal in their, uh, you know, hawkish trend in the balance sheet, in the the reduction of the balance sheet. And to me, that was the first sign that the Fed can't normalize balance sheet. They just can't do it. Um, and, And... to the extent that that becomes clearer, that's where markets start to realize, okay, this is monetization and this is inflationary in a systemic way. It's interesting how the um, the uh, money supply has been shrinking, um, well, negative growth, and the inflation has been coming down. Well, there is a correlation. Is there a causation is my question. Well, I mean, inflation is such a... You know, uh, there's so many moving p- moving parts, and and you know, it's really difficult to nail down what drives what. But I, I do think that you know, my friend John Hussman recently pointed out that what Paul Volcker was most successful in doing was restoring confidence in monetary um, uh, just sanity, monetary sanity. That the Fed the Fed was willing to do whatever it took to to normalize the balance sheet back in, you know, 40 plus years ago. Um, And so I I think the confidence in the central bank's willingness and ability to rein in inflation is just as important as any of these other dynamics that we're talking about. And so if the Fed, you know, Jay Powell's showing us through this, you know, banking, you know, mini banking rescue that they went through, that the Fed is not willing to do whatever it takes to normalize the balance sheet, that's a signal to markets that uh, inflation is maybe a, a longer term problem and it's not going to immediately come back down in the way that uh, that uh, many market players have been expecting now for a year or two years. Uh, what is your longer term outlook on inflation then? Well, I think there are a, a lot of secular forces. I think, you know, the fiscal fiscal policy is one driver of, you know, longer term inflationary dynamics. I think demographics are another one. The Great Demographic Reversal, great book. I think it's a must read for for any market player. Uh, I think it came out about a year ago. Um, you know, basically outlines how the shrinking labor force relative to the overall population, the aging of societies, puts a greater demand on a smaller percentage of the population is is a natural force for higher wage inflation and these types of things. And so demographics are an inflationary trend. And deglobalization is another one where, you know, this bringing reshoring of manufacturing and things is going to be inordinately expensive, right? We're already finding out that, you know, uh, we just don't have the labor to, I mean, look at look at the semiconductor manufacturing we want to bring home back to the United States. We don't have the engineers graduating to to run these, these uh, semiconductor manufacturing plants. And so uh, that's also, you know, a, a very inflationary trend. If you... In fact, globalization might have been the, the strongest disinflationary trend over the last 40 years, just offshoring labor, lowering production costs and all that. So now that that globalization trend has come to an end, you lose that that disinflationary force. And so I think there's just a lot of secular forces of inflation um, that are more far more important than the cyclical things that people are monitoring. And uh probably mean that we are in a new a new era in terms of inflation and, and what that means for economies and markets, et cetera. I, I want to come back to inflation. Uh, but first, you, you mentioned that globalization has come to an end, I believe is what you, you said. What, what, what do you mean by that? Are we seeing evidence of deglobalization on a on a rapid scale? 
Yeah, actually, global trade peaked in 2008 or 9, around the time of the great financial crisis. We've seen it decline for the last 15 years. So you have, uh, you know, essentially, uh, you know, you look at um, on earnings calls, just the number of mentions of reshoring, of, uh, you know, bringing home production, and it's going through the roof. Essentially, the pandemic put a massive amount of pressure on companies of all kinds to take greater control of the supply chain. Right? We had such a problem with supply chains through the pandemic that it made companies realize, okay, just in time, manufacturing was great when there are no geopolitical problems, when there's no pandemic. But in an era where you're starting to have some geopolitical risks and uh, you know other potential issues, just in time manufacturing can become a real problem. And so you need to have greater control of the supply chain. What does that mean? That means reshoring or quote unquote friend shoring of production. So you're seeing um, you know, production move to countries that are closer to the end markets and to maybe friendlier kind of jurisdictions and things. And so those trends, right, uh, you know, are represent a reversal of the, the sh uh, offshoring of labor to the lowest cost producer, uh, which was a huge disinflationary force in the past 20, 30 years. Wait, what, but why are, why are companies doing this? Presumably, if you're moving away from low cost producers to closer to home producers or suppliers, rather, you're, 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 you're squeezing your own margins unless you're finding other ways to cut costs. You're squeezing your own margins unless you have, uh, you know, the ability to raise prices at will, which is what we've seen with companies, right? They've been able to raise prices dramatically. And you could argue that's one of the other important drivers of inflation is the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, lack of competition that we've seen in the economy, right? In the last 40 years, we've had, you know, Chicago School of Economics and uh, a different school of thought in terms of antitrust policy where we've allowed massive consolidation across a number of industries where maybe you don't have monopolies, but you have duopolies and maybe two or three companies that own different markets. And so they, you know, that's what we've seen is that that lack of competition that's been you know, created in the last 20, 30 years also has allowed companies to raise prices at will because they, there's very, you know, little competition, a lot less competition for goods and services. So, so yeah, it, all of these things, I think, work together to create a more inflationary dynamic. When we talk about the incentives, going back to the incentives again, is there a political incentive to move production or supplies back closer to home? Uh, is there an economic incentive or is it simply an issue of security and, and self-reliance? I think it's a little bit of everything. I, I think that, um, that you know, there's political incentives now uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act and all types of incentives to, to bring production back home. That's really kind of the zeitgeist now is, uh, you know, companies are are looking at, you know, if, do I have much production do I have in China, right? We have uh, the sentiment towards, you know, American-Chinese relations, you know, has been deteriorating. Um, Donald Trump, it's continued through the Biden administration. And so I think companies are looking at, okay, what type of risk am I taking, existential risk potentially, by having the majority of my manufacturing in China. Um, and that's a th something they haven't had to think about until the past several years. Then the pandemic made those risks even more apparent. And so I think you have companies that are starting to look at this. I mean, even Apple has you know 90% plus of its production in China, and they're really trying to move, move as much as they can to, to India and other places without upsetting the Chinese authorities. Um, but I think that, you know, other companies have a little bit easier time of it and, and uh, you know, are doing it in a more dramatic way. But, but if even Apple is doing it and Apple's really been poster child of this, this trend, um, then, it, then it's a sign that this is, this is a, a, a major impetus for companies in every, in every sector of the economy. Uh, so then long term, do you think that the Federal Reserve will be able to succeed in its mission to bring inflation down to its 2% bound? I don't think they'll be able to do it without fiscal help. Um, I think that, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the Fed, when you look at the Fed's balance sheet and you look at, you know, the Fed's balance sheet to GDP and federal debt to GDP, they've been on the exact same trajectory for the last 15 years. 
me, that shows we're at a time where uh, we're now witnessing fiscal dominance. Essentially, the Fed has to do what the fiscal authority needs. And so the the, the Fed can't really, uh, you know, there really isn't discretionary monetary policy. I mean, we will see it for short periods of time. But we're going to reach points in time where the Fed is going to be forced to come back into the market, uh, probably implement yield curve control, something along those lines, because the markets won't be able to function without that added demand from the Fed stepping into the Treasury market. So, I, you know, I think you're going to need some kind of fiscal reform longer term in order to to really uh, make a dent in the, the secular forces inflation that we're seeing now. Uh, what does yield curve control look like in terms of the Fed funds rate and uh, and, and and treasury yields? Well, I think you know we're, we 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 might it might come sooner rather than later. I mean, I've been watching longer term treasury yields, uh, and if you look at something like the copper to gold ratio over the past six months, it's been plunging. Right, that suggests that interest rates should have been coming down. They've been doing the opposite over the last couple of months, which tells me there's something going on, right? If you have copper to gold ratio going down, telling you economy's weak, rates should come down, and they're not doing that. That tells me the treasury market is potentially worried about uh, you know, increased issuance, increased supply without that demand from the Fed to, to support it. And so, you know, longer term treasuries aren't acting the way that they should. Now, we let's imagine we get a, a, a compromise, raise the debt ceiling, and we get a flood of new issuance of treasuries. Uh, if rates continue going up, even as the economy continues weakening, I mean, and there's tons of signs, leading indicators pointing towards recession. You get rates going up, even as you get closer to recession, that could pretend, that trend, you know, if it does, if it continues, becomes really problematic for the Fed. Right? You cannot have an economy going into recession and interest rates going significantly higher. I mean, if you get back above 4% on the 10-year, as it gets close, as we get closer to the recession, that's going to put, a, I think, a great deal of pressure on the Fed to, to uh, look at, you know, using the balance sheet in some way to, to affect the interest rates across the curve. So, um, it, you know, we're approaching an interesting time over the next few months. And I think, you know, treasury market is the most important thing to watch. Okay, yeah, let's talk about this uh, outlook for the next couple of months. Is this looming recession the number one risk for investors right now, or are there other risks? I, you know, I, I think it probably is for equity investors because, um, you know, equities are pricing in a significant rebound in corporate earnings growth, right? So if we get a recession, earnings are, earnings are going down, right? Earnings are going to go down. Earnings go down 20%, so, you know, in a recession. The fact that earnings stocks are now pricing in analyst estimates, which show about an eight percent increase in earnings by the end of the year, that's that's you know the gap there creates a real problem, I think, for equities. Uh, And so, if we if we are heading into recession, as I think we are in the second half of this year, that could be catalyst for you know uh, return to the bear market for equities. By it. I'm guessing the order of around 20% a correction of the S&P 500 if we, were, if we were to apply the same earnings correction. You know, it, it could be it could be significantly more than that, just because stocks have have, like I said, priced in now priced in earnings growth through the end of, end of the year. If we do get an earnings decline instead of growth, um, you know, it it, it could be uh, you know a steeper decline than than just the you know, 20%. Um, you know, I, I think probably we'll test those those lows on the S&P 500 that we saw, you know, in October of last year. And, uh, you know, f- from that point, um, it'll really depend on what the, what the economic prognosis looks like. Now, does the economy necessarily need an external shock or a further catalyst to spiral into a definitive recession? Or are we naturally on the growth path to a contraction, keeping in mind that in 2020, the catalyst was a global pandemic and shutdowns worldwide and supply chain issues. In 2008, the global financial crisis, it was a meltdown of the housing market and the collapse of Lehman Brothers and other banks. What would need to be the catalyst this time? Do we need one? I, I don't think we need necessarily need a catalyst. I, you know, there's, I, the, it's probably enough of a catalyst that 
even the Fed's going to have to keep raising rates until we get a recession, right? Until we see unemployment rising, the labor market start showing some real slack, the Fed's going to have to at least keep rates where they are, if not keep keep raising. Um, you know, and and the stock market always reacts poorly to seeing uh, rising unemployment. Right? That that is you know your your hard and fast you know recession indicator. Once you start seeing rising unemployment, and and so. Uh, I don't think we we need anything. I mean, the, the I'll tell you the two major indicators I've been looking at for the last uh, you know few years, and that's just a composite of the dollar, uh, interest rates, and oil prices. When that composite goes up dramatically, it is about a, a two year lead for an earnings decline. Um, you know, uh, later on, we've seen the oil price go from negative. Right to about just about a year ago, well over hundred dollars a barrel. We saw interest rates go from fifty basis points on the ten year to four percent. Right <laughs> on the ten year, not too long ago, we saw um, uh, you know the dollar uh, strength um, very significant as a part of this hawkish reversal of monetary policy. So this composite suggests that we can we're going to have a uh, recession in the second half of this year uh, almost without fail, and it's a really good leading indicator for earnings. At the same time, there's another interesting indicator. I don't really know anybody else who looks at this. And this is basically the insider sell to buy ratio. I'm just talking about executives and directors at, at companies, um, you know, American publicly traded companies. That is also a really good two year lead on the economy. Um, and we saw such massive insider selling in 2021, I mean, bigger than anything we've ever seen before that suggests that two years later, you know, from that fall of 2021 time period, when that sell to buy ratio peaked, you're going to see a very weak uh, economic period. And that's actually a good, uh, you know, uh, buy signal too. So when you see a lot of insider buying, very little selling, that's a really good positive sign for the economy and, and for the stock market two years later. We still really haven't seen a lot of insider buying yet. We've started to see some of it has picked up. But I'm waiting for that time to see where, where insiders really step in and get confident that they're seeing a low in their business and that stock prices are too low. Um, you know, that that could be coming in the next few months, but we haven't seen that yet. It's it's interesting because as these things happen that you described, inflation still persisted. I mean, the inflation rate was coming down, but prices were still going up because we had inflation, not deflation. Normally in people's minds, we associate higher prices with economic growth, but it wasn't really coupled with strong growth outlook, right? That the inflation was there for other reasons. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's, that's something that maybe people don't necessarily appreciate because we haven't seen inflation for a long time is that when you look back to the mid seventies, that 73, 74 bear market and recession, um, nominal GP growth, even at the worst point of that recession, nominal GP growth was still growing 5% for year. But it was a recession because inflation was running hotter and unemployment rose and all the other things that NBER uses to define a recession. So, you know, just because nominal growth still looks good doesn't mean you can't have a recession. And I think that's kind of what people have in their heads is they think that, you know, look back to the great financial crisis or even the COVID crash. You need a decline in nominal figures in order to get a recession, and I don't—I just don't think that's the case. You can have a stagflationary type of environment where maybe nominal growth is still is still rising, but uh, not as much as inflation. Do you think recession or this coming recession will cause deflation? You know, it, it really depends. I think on. Um, the the speed of uh, you know any correction in asset prices, you know we could for a short period of time, but I don't think you know I mean now we're talking getting you know to the difference between kind of cyclical forces and the secular forces. What I was talking about in terms of inflation or kind of longer term issues, we could see I think you know cyclical you know uh, deflation for a very short period of time if you had. A, you know, a very severe downturn in real estate in in asset prices. I think you could see that. But um, if without that kind of like a, a crash, I think it's difficult to see outright deflation. I wonder if it's in society's interest for the central bank to target a zero percent inflation rate, or perhaps even a one percent deflation. I mean, 
what would that imply? Presumably, people want their living standards to increase if everything becomes cheaper. I mean, that's just a very simplif- simplified version of things, right? But what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, Jim Grant has, you know, made this point before that we've experienced as a, as a country, we've experienced deflation in the past where it, it wasn't a bad thing in, in any respect. It's only bad for, for debtors, right? <laughs> and and right. this is the problem. This is why the Fed cannot allow for, for deflation is because the debt is so large that if we do see a deflationary period, that means debt in real terms is growing even faster. And so, so you know, yes, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, deflation, not necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, as my friend Tom McClellan points out, the Fed's mandate is 0% inflation. And even Ben Bernanke, I think, pointed out recently what, that- What do you mean by that? What do you, yeah. The, the, the legal mandate is 0%. If you look at in the seven, when the Fed was given the dual mandate by Congress, it's it's zero percent is the mandate in writing. The reason, but the two and even Ben Bernanke has said recently, the two percent target was created by the Fed without the approval of Congress, and so Congress has because Congress has not challenged the Fed on this issue. The Fed has taken it as that's an implicit. Uh, you know, green light that the Fed can pursue a 2%. But the, the Congress has the right to say, no, 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 your mandate is zero. Uh, but but I think what scares the Fed about zero is uh, you get to that zero lower bound and they run out of tools. Uh, and, and that's what happened kind of. I think that's why we saw so much money printing and things during COVID is the Fed was deathly afraid of deflation and, the, and uh, you know, not having any monetary tools uh, once you already are at zero percent interest rates um, and, and and running out of essentially ammunition, and so that I think that's the impetus behind the two percent target. But it's certainly not; it doesn't have any uh, explicit approval by Congress. And speaking of tools to fight a slowdown, the 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 Fed funds rate has now risen above 500 basis points. What do you think they're going to do into the next recession? I've heard this argument from another economist I've spoken to, which is that historically the Federal Reserve cuts rates by up to 500 basis points into and or during a recession. So if we apply the same history, we could see rates cutting it back down to zero. Is that something that's possible? I think if the Fed if the Fed starts cutting rates while core PCE is still above target, um, they're opening a door to the door to a bigger inflation problem. And Jay Powell has said this. He said that you know we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the 1970s, which is assuming that the inflation problem is is uh, in hand, that we've actually fixed it. And so it's possible that they cut rates, of course, uh, you know, with with inflation still above target. Uh, but I, I think that what, what the Fed is going to be faced with, right, is is reigning in inflation, doing enough to fix the inflation problem or protecting financial stability. I think that's that's the, the what they're going to be faced with is that if you know they keep raising rates or even leave rates at a high level through recession we're going to see you know potentially the the troubles in the banking system regional banks are just kind of the tip of the iceberg of some of the other problems uh in a financialized economy that could really create financial stability problems, and that would be the thing that would force the Fed to potentially cut interest rates. But that's still making a decision between actually finishing the job on inflation or protecting financial stability. That's not a choice I think any central bank wants to make, but that's what they're going to be faced with. Which is to say that they're, they have limited tools to fight this recession because their their hands are tied by inflation. Is that is that accurate to make, a st- accurate statement to make? Absolutely. At some point, though, the, you know, obviously, Jay Powell has showed us, shown us with the, uh, the the regional banking, the way they address the regional banking crisis by expanding the balance sheet once again, is that their priority is financial stability over inflation. And so I, I think that, you know, Jay Powell wants to talk like Paul Volcker and say, we're not going to quit before we've completed the job. But at the same time, his actions speak louder than words. So let's put all this together then. What should the investor's priority be then in light of this coming recession by the end of the year that you're projecting and uh, the Fed's limited options? Well, I think, you know, that if you look back at what worked over the past since in the post GFC period after the great financial crisis, 
we had low inflation, we had zero uh, percent interest rates, we had money printing, and financial assets did phenomenally well. Right, we saw uh, bonds do extremely well into the you know uh, low in- lows of interest rates we saw in 2020. We saw you know stocks do extremely well. So financial assets were kind of the way to go during that era. Uh, if we are now in a new era where inflation has made a comeback, interest rates are kind of on a, uh, a longer term path higher, uh, and, and more importantly, perhaps real interest rates are going to remain you know, negative in this inflationary environment, then I think you have to focus on real assets to an extent that you haven't in the past. The ways that, you know, things that protect your purchasing power. That's going to be, you know, uh, commodities, tips, uh, certain forms of real estate, and of course, precious metals. Just a note on um, on monetizing debt that we talked about earlier in the interview. Do you ever think there will come a point where the government, with the Federal Reserve, will realize that they don't want to monetize the debt anymore and perhaps return to some sort of anchor currency, like a gold standard, where they're 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 bound by the the limits of that standard to no longer be able to just print money at will. It doesn't have to be gold. It could be any hard asset. It could be even Bitcoin, some people speculated. Yeah. You know, I mean, that that is the history of of money and finance, right? Is that we we go through these monetary experiments and we always come back to some sort of, you know, fixed monetary standard. Um, Because every time we leave uh, that type of a fixed monetary standard, we realize the temptation to print money and to 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 create false wealth is is too great for any any human being to resist the pressure, uh, and and so I think eventually probably we will. I mean I you know hopefully sooner rather than later, but um, but yeah it's it's not as my friend Ben Hunt says I'm I'm uh, hopeful but I'm not optimistic it's going to happen anytime soon. Would that solve the inflation problem? Would that anchor the inflation level around a, a certain range? Sure, right? I mean, of course, that's why that's why uh, you implement that type of a framework in the first place is because it it uh, it, it makes that, you know it it, it makes a self uh, it's a self-correcting mechanism, right? Uh, you know and, and so, yeah, I mean, that eventually will get to a point where, where people see that, realize it, and demand it. Does something like a gold standard limit a nation's ability to grow? In other words, if they can't if they can't finance their debt and use leverage as a tool for growth, does that mean overall we'll have lower growth or no? Well, you know, growth, real, real growth, uh, you know, typically comes back, you know, what is it? It comes back to population and productivity. And so whenever you want to try and create growth without those things, you know, you're going to be creating it in a, in a false way. And so, you know, really what we should be focused on, if you care about growth as a country, is how do we improve productivity? How do we make this happen? This is the thing that we should be focused on. And I think instead, what we've been focused on is how do we make create the illusion of growth <laughs> through knee printing and these things. And I think that's that's just uh, you know uh, a dangerous distraction. All right. Uh, well, I think we'll end it there. Excellent discussion, Jesse. Where can people learn more about your work? Uh, you have a you have a report. You have a podcast. Where, where, where can we find your work? Yeah, uh, thefelderreport.com is my website. I try and put up a blog post or a podcast once a week. I'm pretty active on Twitter. My handle is just at Jesse Felder. And I, I post there a lot of kind of the stuff that I'm reading, charts and things that I find interesting. Okay, I'm, I'm actually curious because, you know, as, as a fellow podcaster, what, what are some of the themes you're exploring on your show? And uh, how, do you, how do you select uh, topics to talk about? It's a great question. You know, I've been on hiatus for, you know, the past six months or so, but essentially there's, there are, there's a handful of people out there that I find to just be fascinating thinkers. Uh, and so I'm curious, uh, you know, to ha- to really have them on my podcast to dissect their process. So how to, how, you know, what is it, you know, about your process, about your framework that is unique and uniquely helpful in, in approaching a lot of these things that we, we just talked about today. And so, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's usually I, I'm reading something or following somebody and, and who comes up with something that's uniquely insightful and, uh, 
you know, I approach him to say, Hey, you know, let me uh, pick your brain for an hour or so. And, and, uh, on the podcast, has there any, has there been anybody that really changed the way you think about investing and t- sort of turned your own thesis upside down? Absolutely. Um, in fact, you know, that's, that's part of it is I, I want to learn new things constantly and be able to add things to my repertoire. So just for example, you know, my friend, Michael Oliver, who uh, runs a company, uh, momentum structural analysis has a really unique way of looking at price action in the markets. It's I've, I've not seen anybody else use methods even similar to his. Um, it's something that I've I've adopted into my own framework because I find it so so valuable. Interesting. Well, Jesse, thank you very much for your time and for spending time with us to give us your insights. Appreciate it. Thanks, David. That was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Yeah, that was fun. We'll do it again. And thank you for uh, watching the David Lynn Report. Stay tuned for more and don't forget to subscribe.